It's only natural for us to want to see a modern version of some of the most memorable cars that we grew up with. Very few automakers actually decide to make that happen. Some have massive success and in others we kind of wish that they never even tried. Today I'll be showing you guys 5 iconic cars that were reintroduced in the modern era but in the worst possible way. The first car is the Acura NSX. It really saddens me to have to include this car in the list. When it comes to 90s Japanese sports cars, this has always been my favorite out of the bunch. As far as the modern one goes, well, let's put it like this. It has to be one of the biggest automotive failures in recent times. It was built and designed to revive our loves for one of the most iconic Japanese cars of all time, but it didn't work out too well. Sales weren't too bad when it was first released in 2017, selling 581 units in the US, which honestly isn't too bad for a supercar. But then 2018 came along and sales plummeted with only 170 units being sold, including only 5 sold in the month of April. And don't let the sales numbers convince you. How many times have you actually seen a modern Acura NSX out in the wild when you're commuting somewhere or even at your local cars and coffee event? Heck, I haven't even seen any of the big automotive YouTubers show any interest in it, and they typically do every time there's a hot new supercar that's released. The real reason to why the Acura NSX flop can sometimes be seen as a mysterious thing. Performance wise, it's definitely very competitive compared to some of the most expensive supercars out there. It came equipped with a 3 liter twin turbocharged V6 and 3 electric motors, altogether producing 573 horsepower and 476 pound feet of torque. For example, the NSX runs from 0 to 60 in less than 3 seconds, making it quicker than the higher spec Audi R8 for around $39,000 less. The Acura NSX starts at around $157, while the Audi R8 V10 performance starts at around $196,000. Which leads me to the next potential reason the NSX flops so hard. It is simply priced a bit too high. Well, for an Acura at least. The interior shares many Acura parts from other much less expensive models, including the turning and wiper stocks, power window controls, and even the infotainment display. Price-wise, it's right there with the more popular Audi R8, and it's much more expensive than the Nissan GTR, one of the best bang for your buck performance cars in existence. But honestly, I think one of the biggest reasons the Acura NSX didn't do too well in the market was because it took forever to actually hit the market. After many years of rumors and teases about a potential new generation NSX starting immediately after the first gen reached its end in 2005 and after the concept was revealed in 2012, it took till 2016 to release the first 2017 model. There is only so long you can keep people excited and attentive for before they start to lose interest and honestly I think the second generation NSX fell victim to just that. All that said, I personally like the new NSX and all the technology that was put into it. As an Acura, it should be much more reliable and affordable to maintain compared to other Italian and European supercars. Efficiency wise while it probably won't matter to those that have the money to buy one it has a great fuel economy at 21 miles per gallon city and 22 miles per gallon highway which is amazing for a car such as this one as far as non-exciting interior i find it to match its roots with easy simple buttons straight to the point functionality with its primary focus on driving experience truth be told even the first generation nsx was slow to pick up in sales back in the 90s and then later to become as popular as we remember it today maybe that'll happen to the second generation nsx while i doubt it you never know. The next car on the list is a Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross. Yes, another Japanese car legend has failed to make a proper return in the modern era and in the worst possible way. It was rebirthed as a crossover. To be fair, the Mitsubishi did attempt to differentiate the crossover by not just calling it the Eclipse, but rather calling it the Eclipse Cross. But why? The crossover shares absolutely no characteristics or DNA to what we remember the 90s Eclipse being. And by the 90s Eclipse, I'm primarily referring to the more memorable models like the Eclipse GSX and even the GST. The bottom trims were really much of an interest to car enthusiasts and tuners. Some of you may have watched my video where I pretty much ripped the Eclipse apart with more than half of the comment section telling me how wrong I was because of the GST and GSX. Here's the thing, I never once mentioned or badmouthed those two performance models and I would be a fool to do so since the GSX and GST were performance bargains at the time with huge tuning potential. Truth be told, as a kid the Eclipse GSX was among one of the cars on my bucket list. Anyways, that said, let's talk about the only Eclipse that is still produced today, sadly. It might sell well over Overall, because let's be honest, crossovers is what's hot right now, but for car enthusiasts, it's a massive slap in the face, especially by rocking the iconic name. There is a passage on Mitsubishi's website that says the Eclipse Spirit still lives on and goes on to compare the GSX and GST models to the Eclipse Cross. Well, let's take a look. The Eclipse Cross comes with an available all wheel drive system and turbocharged engine. Hmm, just like the GSX from the 90s, right? Well, that's where the similarities end. The measly 1.5 liter turbocharged engine the Eclipse Cross comes equipped with on all trims produces 
produces only 152 horsepower and 184 pound-feet of torque. Well, how about the following stat? The Eclipse Cross does 0 to 60 in 8.6 seconds. It's quite clear that Mitsubishi chose to target a completely different demographic and shove the OG fans that really appreciated everything about the 90s Eclipse had to offer to the side. There was so much hype behind the Eclipse, especially because it was featured on the Fast and the Furious film. The 1995 to 1999 model year was arguably the most popular for modifying, very memorable. But then the models from year 2000 and up was the beginning of the end for the Eclipse. There was no turbo or all-wheel drive version offered, just a naturally aspirated V6 power in the front wheels, which created zero excitement for car enthusiasts. And then years later, Mitsubishi decides to dagger the iconic nameplate with the Eclipse Cross. Third car is the Pontiac GTO. This is a car many may not even recall that existed from 2004 to 2006. 30 years after the retirement of the original, GM tried to pull a fast one with the modern GTO, literally. No time nor effort was put into what once was a legendary muscle car of the 60s and 70s. Instead, Pontiac decided to rebadge an already existing and aging car known in Australia as the Holden Monaro. Here is the thing, rebadging or badge engineering as some call it is not necessarily a bad thing and can sometimes actually help certain markets receive cars they normally wouldn't receive. But don't rebadge a car that has a body style that has already been around for years. Rebadge at the beginning of a body style cycle, not towards the end of it. The fifth generation Pontiac GTO, which is the one I'm referring to in this video, failed to sell well in its first year in 2004, and I really do believe its outdated exterior design had something to do with it. It was truly its downfall in many people's eyes. Nothing about it resembled a muscle car, and it just didn't look exciting at all. After the first year of disappointing sales, Pontiac attempted to make it look more aggressive by adding two scoops to the hood and split rear exhaust. The power plant it eventually carried was actually very impressive and many that had a chance to drive the GTO praised its performance. After year one, it carried a 6 liter LS2 engine that produced 400 horsepower and 400 pound feet of torque along with a 6 speed manual. While it was a pretty heavy car, it still managed to run from 0 to 60 in just 4.7 seconds, which was very impressive at the time. The GTO was a perfect example of judging a book by its cover, which seems like many chose to do. While it didn't look all that good, the straight line performance you got was actually quite competitive. Some say that the model GTO would have sold much better if it had used a different nameplate instead of trying to latch on to a very iconic GTO nameplate. And that we will never know. The GTO was Pontiac's last muscle car ever produced just after the 2002 Firebird, and it might have just been part of the reason Pontiac as a brand eventually died. Fourth car on the list is the GR Supra, also known as the Supra Mark V. This has to be the most controversial car in the modern era. Some praise it and can't wait for its official release, and others heavily despise it and choose to burn down the internet forums and social media platforms with nothing but hate comments. The FT1 concept brought excitement and anticipation to the car community once it was unveiled in January of 2014. The anticipation was felt much like it's felt on Christmas Eve. And then finally, after years of closed curtains, Toyota threw a massive bombshell at all of us. Some saw it as an okay and acceptable thing because of the circumstances and others went into outrage. Toyota decided to partner with BMW for their new Super by using the platform of the new BMW Z4. I personally didn't have an issue with this move for one, because I'm a BMW fan, no surprise there, and two, because if it wasn't for the partnership, the GR Super probably wouldn't be a thing. It was very unlikely that Toyota would invest so much resources and money on search and development to create a brand new sports car from scratch, especially in today's era where it seems like two-door sports cars are being shoved to the side in favor of SUVs and electric vehicles. That said, it does seem like Toyota took the easy way out and just grabbed the new BMW Z4, put a mask on it, and called it their new sports car. The GR Super carries a variation of BMW's new B58 engine, features nearly identical interior features, and is just considered by many hardcore fans, a BMW Z4 with a Toyota badge on it. And because of BMW's track record of reliability issues and costly repairs, Toyota fans can't seem to understand such a ballsy move by Toyota. It seems like longtime super fans would have been happier with an upgraded version of a 20 year old plus engine, the 2JZ GTE, rather than have a technologically advanced engine like the B58. Here's my thought on that. Would Toyota really jeopardize their amazing reputation and reliability for the sake of releasing a new sports car? It has been said that Toyota was heavily involved to ensure that BMW's B58 engine met all of Toyota's rigorous dependability tests to ensure poor reliability is not a thing. And just like the 2JZ's engine which was capable of handling a massive amount of boost making it great for tuning, the B58's closed deck design will be very tune friendly as well. It's a 3 liter turbocharged straight 6 engine that produces 335 horsepower and 369 pound feet of torque. And with new reports we have learned that those are very conservative numbers given by Toyota. Both car and driver and motor trend had the chance to put the GR Supra on a dyno and performance 
numbers were considerably more than the official ones. The GR Super 0 to 60 time is 3.8 seconds, which is quite impressive, and its handling was specifically tuned by Toyota themselves. At least that is what it said. I'm sure there will be many comparison reviews online once the GR Super hits the market later this month. I can go on and on about the new generation Supra, including its price point and the no traditional manual option, but honestly, it would make this video way too long. I can see and relate from both sides, the ones that can't wait to drive one and the ones that hate it. But all I have to say is wait till it releases before forming an opinion. The fifth and final car on the list is the Hummer H2. It's definitely been a bizarre tale with the Hummer brand. It started off with what seems like massive success and then shortly after led to death in what appeared to be in a blink of an eye. The Hummer was first introduced as a military vehicle by the name of Humvee. Both names somewhat overlap each other but Hummer was more known as the version available to civilians while the Humvee refers to the military ones. As a military truck it made perfect sense since its main purpose was primarily for personnel and light cargo transport behind front lines. It was rugged, massive and built for off-road. The H1 was exciting at first and was made popular and possible by the one and only Arnold Schwarzenegger. But as the years went by, focus on climate change, gas prices and hybrid powered vehicles started to become a serious interest. And that leads us to the Hummer H2 which was released not too long after the tragic 9-11 event. Those that chose to drive a Hummer H2 were commonly seen as non-patriotic because of its massive thirst for fuel. Earlier models came equipped with a massive 6 liter V8 engine while the later models came equipped with a 6.2 liter V8. The H2 was uncomfortably huge, very militaristic and didn't really do anything particularly well. It didn't have any real purpose. The H2 was for those that really wanted to make a statement and seek attention but most of the attention H2 drivers were receiving was negative especially when 2008 rolled around and gas prices doubled. Sales plummeted and the hate became so real that a Hummer dealership was torched in Southern California. Arnold being governor at the time was under pressure and ultimately decided to sell his fleet of Hummers in September of 2006 for a reported $950,000. The Hummer H2 was just released at the wrong time and sent all the wrong signals which ultimately resulted in the brand's demise. Oh and let's not forget it was painfully slow, 0-60 to 60 in 10.7 seconds. Interesting huh? Now I want to know what you guys think. Was I right for including these 5 cars on the list? Or was that wrong? Let me know in the comment section below. I really do hope you guys enjoyed the video and if you did, make sure and like it. And if you want to see more, make sure to subscribe with notifications on. That way you don't miss out on the next video. As always, thanks for watching. Till next time.